Hello, viewers. Welcome to this episode of Healthy India. Today, we're going to talk about a gland that all of you know about or have at least heard about, the thyroid or the butterfly gland. To explain about thyroid, we have a group of very prominent experts. We have Dr. Sujay Ghosh, who is Professor of Endocrinology at the PGI Kolkata. We have Dr. Unni Krishnan, who is the CEO and Chief Endocrinologist at the Chilaram Hospital in Pune. Let's first understand what the thyroid gland is. The thyroid is a butterfly-shaped gland that straddles our windpipe here, the trachea. And from here, its position here, it produces a hormone called T4. That hormone gets converted in the blood or the tissues to another active hormone called T3. This T4, T3 complex actually is responsible for maintaining our body metabolism. So the, the capacity of the body to utilize all its sources like food and convert them into energy is what is called metabolism. So the thyroid gland has an impact throughout the body. So let's start from the top. It can have an impact on our hair. You know, it can have impact on the eyes. It can impact our speech. It can get enlarged here. This butterfly-shaped gland can get enlarged here and produce what is called a goiter. It can affect our heart. Most certainly, it can affect our brain. Never forget that. So heart and brain both can be affected by dysfunction of thyroid. But as we go along also, it can affect our muscle, our muscle strength. It can affect our bones. So virtually there is no part of the body that is immune to the effects of thyroid. Uh, so whenever a thyroid gland is over-functioning, producing more thyroid hormone than it's supposed to, then we get one set of abnormalities. But the far more commoner one is when there is an under-function of the thyroid gland, something called hypothyroidism, which is what we'll be focusing on today. So when we say hypothyroidism, it means that the gland is not producing enough hormone and that produces consequences in all the parts of the body that, we, uh, that we've just spoken about. So let's first start by understanding, is it really common? Firstly, even before I do that, it's important to realize that thyroid is not a disease. Thyroid is a gland. And it's either over-function or under-function, that's a disease. So when people say, I've got thyroid, well, we all have thyroid because it's a gland over here. It's like saying, I have a heart, I have a brain. So when you say thyroid, you're just referring to a gland. And actually, when you say hypothyroidism, that means you're talking of thyroid disease. So let's ask uh, uh, Dr. Unni Krishnan about how common thyroid disease is in India. Uh, he, I know that he has done some uh, pioneering studies on that. And, you know, especially in the context of hypothyroidism, Dr. Unni. Thank you. First of all, pleasure and privilege to be here. And hypothyroidism is very common in India. Studies have shown that the prevalence of hypothyroidism is about 3.5%, and there is a milder form of hypothyroidism called subclinical hypothyroidism, which on an average, the prevalence is about 8%. So taking together the mild form of hypothyroidism, subclinical, and the overt form of hypothyroidism, uh, one would say that about 11% of the population may have hypothyroidism, and uh, that means about 1 in 10 Indians could have some form of hypothyroidism, but particularly hypothyroidism is more common in women as compared to men. Yes, uh, uh, so, so the important part here is, which you very uh, neatly brought out, is that there are two types of hypothyroidism, or two grades of hypothyroidism rather. One is what we call overt hypothyroidism, which means that there is an actual abnormality in T4 and TSH, the hormones that we check to diagnose hypothyroidism. And the other one is where there is subclinical, a more subtle form, where it may be a biochemical abnormality alone and may not always have any 
clinical implications. So when we include subclinical in the whole thyroid disorders gamut, then of course the prevalence of thyroid disorders goes up quite a lot. So even otherwise, the numbers you're describing are quite staggering. A very high proportion of our population is actually suffering from uh, hypothyroidism or thyroid-related disorders. So do you think, Dr. Unikrishnan, that this has gone up? I mean, is it just that we are diagnosing thyroid disorders more? Or do you think that the prevalence has actually gone up? So that's a very uh, important question. I think that it's more of early diagnosis and early detection and more awareness on the public's part, as well as more screening and purposive screening by clinical doctors that could have uh, you know, related to it. Earlier, of course, iodine deficiency was a common cause of hypothyroidism, but now it's a mixture of different causes. And one is not really sure whether the prevalence has gone up, but uh, a diagnosis is being picked up earlier. I think it's a combination of both, but mainly I think heightened awareness and uh, uh, better uh, uh, detection has contributed. Much better testing, uh, taking you back more than 30 years ago when I was a, 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 a a DM student at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, the thyroid report was a big deal. It used to come back in weeks, and now patients get, in, you know, patients get impatient if the report is not back within a few hours. So the testing has improved dramatically, enabling us to diagnose these cases much earlier and treat them in a much more effective and gratifying way. Uh, let me go to Professor Ghosh now. Dr. Ghosh, uh, you know, we all talk about thyroid. And the one thing everyone says thyroid is, you know, my uh, weight is going up. And I'm sure I have thyroid. So in all our endocrine OPDs, as you know, people who come with weight are always worried about thyroid. What are actually the common symptoms of hypothyroidism? Thank you, Dr. Mittal, for having me on the show. And I think that's a very valid and pertinent question. And at the very beginning, you did mention that the thyroid hormone acts in almost every body system and tissues. Therefore, it's not surprising that if you have deficiency of thyroid hormones, you might present with almost problems with any organ system that you are talking about. Also, it's important to remember that patients might have hypothyroidism and yet have no symptoms at all, or the symptoms might be very subtle or very nonspecific. You know, just like you said, that, you know, weight gain might be a feature of hypothyroidism. But having said that, if you have 100 patients coming to our outpatient clinic with, who have a problem with their body weight, probably less than 1% of them are truly because of hypothyroidism. And let us imagine that, you know, you cut my thyroid out and throw it away. The quantum of weight gain is probably going to be to the tune of 4%. So significant obesity usually does not happen with hypothyroidism. The other issue is... That's a very important point. I think we need to remember that, that, that the weight gain that is seen in hypothyroidism is not immense. It's not enormous. It's a couple of, couple of kilograms here and there. So don't, uh, uh, don't ascribe a weight gain of 10, 15, 20 kilograms to your thyroid. Sorry. Don't right. Go ahead. So, and, and the other issue is, if your body weight is more than normal, then there are changes in another hormone called leptin. Now, this leptin works at the level of the brain and causes an increase in the TSH level. So, if you're doing a blood test and you're overweight, you will find that your TSH might be slightly higher than what the cutoffs are, and then you might worry and say, oh, I told you this is what the problem was. But in reality, the problem is not because of the thyroid. The other issue that we've got to remember is that the symptoms and signs of thyroid disorder depends upon the age of presentation and the gender. For example, a newborn child might be having hypothyroidism, which is called neonatal hypothyroidism, where there might not be any symptoms at all because the mother's thyroid hormone is actually protecting the child. As the child grows up, there might be problems in growth and development. Thereafter, there might be problems with the onset of puberty and further sexual development. You can even have sexual precocity if you have thyroid problems as well. And 
In case of a lady, you might have problems in the menstrual cycles. It might be irregular. You might even have excess menstrual bleeding as well. And as we age, you might have other problems in terms of mentation and mental health issues as well. On the contrary, all of the other organs that you've talked about, for example, the brain, there might be slowing of mental function, there might be change of voice, there might be eye problems even with hypothyroidism, though it's more common with an overtly hyperthyroid situation. There might be problems of heart failure, difficulty in breathing. There might be problems of the muscle where you might be feeling weak and there might be problems of constipation. And you've already mentioned to start with, you might have problems with hair loss. But again, remember, you know, not all hair loss is because of your thyroid problems. So starting from your head to toe, you can probably have almost any symptom. And you also mentioned about certain organs, probably the kidneys also. You know, if you look at the renal perfusion, even that might be altered with hypothyroidism. And that might be one reversible cause of improvement of renal function if you treat. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Ghosh is also the Secretary of the Endocrine Society of India at the moment. Uh, I go back to, uh, to Dr. Unikrishnan. Uh, let's talk a little bit about who should get tested. Uh, you know, Uni, everyone's getting thyroid tests. Uh, a whole list of symptoms we are all aware and so wonderfully enumerated by, by, by Sujoy Ghosh. Who should get tested for thyroid? And what test should be done? Uh, so I think not everybody needs to undergo a thyroid function test. That's the first point I want to make. Only persons with the symptoms elucidated by uh, uh, Dr. Ghosh earlier, like, for example, people who have uh, constipation, people who put on weight, but again, weight is uh, something, uh, the weight gain may not be much in hypothyroidism. Children who, who don't gain height, of declining academic performance, reproductive abnormalities, mental health issues. So these are the people who need to get tested. Uh, the other area is that all pregnant women ideally need to be tested uh, for hypothyroidism. And of course, newborns need to be ideally screened. Women who are planning pregnancy also, I think th testing of thyroid functions is good, but not everybody needs to get tested. And among the tests, there are three common blood tests for thyroid. One is the T3 test, second is a T4 test, and the third is a TSH test. If only one test were to be chosen, that test would be the TSH test. And if two tests were to be chosen, it could be the TSH and T4 for hypothyroidism. I'd like to just take a minute to ex explain TSH to our viewers. When the thyroid gland doesn't work, the pituitary gland, which is a little gland behind the area of the bindi on the forehead, just behind that, little gland makes a hormone called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. So when the thyroid gland doesn't work, the pituitary makes TSH and tells the gland to do more work. So when the thyroid gland doesn't work as in hypothyroidism, the TSH goes up. So a high TSH reflects a low level of thyroid hormone in the blood. So if you look at all the tests for hypothyroidism, and if you were to choose one single test, it could be the TSH, and selective uh, uh, testing is better than, you know, testing everybody. So only selected people should be tested. Range of symptoms that happen with hypothyroidism, it makes sense to test at a low threshold, but not everyone requires a test, of course, and uh, quite rightly, the, the FT4 and TSH or T4 and TSH along with the T3, are the primary tests that we use to diagnose hypothyroidism. And out of that, again, the TSH is the most important. And again, emphasizing, if you have just have the TSH elevated, with a normal T3, T4, that is called subclinical hypothyroidism, no cause for panic. And that typically, the TSH in that is below 10, you know, 5, 6, 7, taking an upper limit of 5 for TSH. A number between 5 and 10 is not a reason to panic at all, unless you're pregnant or just a newborn, that's a different story. So by and large, we say that this whole spectrum of subclinical hypothyroidism, you really have to be very judicious, talk to your doctor, talk to an expert, talk to an endocrinologist, who will really tell you whether you require treatment or not. And sometimes uh, we also do an additional test. Uh, and I'll ask uh, Sujoy about that. 
So, you know, another blood test that is often employed in hypothyroidism, do you think that could have anything to do with the etiology? Is that why we are doing it? Like, what is the cause of hypothyroidism? To determine that, sometimes you may do another test, which is the TPO antibody. How commonly should we do that? Initially, if you look at world over, iodine deficiency was the commonest cause of thyroid disorders. In recent times, at least, even in India, we have the iodination program, as a result of which we are probably in the final stages of iodine replete state in India. And the commonest cause of thyroid disorders is probably what we call is autoimmune. What does that mean? It means that the body fails to understand that the thyroid is its own body part and launches an attack against it. So when we look at these autoantibodies, it probably gives us an indirect way of telling us that there is probably an autoimmune problem and if you have maybe the TSH is raised with the T4 is low and the autoimmune antibody that is the anti-TPO antibody is positive, it implies that probably the reason for which the thyroid gland is not working is an autoimmune disorder. That can help us in a number of ways. That can help us in about thinking of other autoimmune glands that might be involved in the body. Secondly, one of the things that Dr. Unni and yourself quite wonderfully elucidated was that the major problem is not overt hypothyroidism but subtle hypothyroidism or subclinical hypothyroidism. And a lot of times the results, like you said, were between 5 and 10. And you are trying to figure out, are these patients likely to progress to overt hypothyroidism? So an antibody positivity might give us some idea whether this individual is going to progress to overt hypothyroidism. Dr. Unni also mentioned about screening pregnant women for thyroid disorders, whether before conceiving or after conceiving. An antibody in such a circumstance is likely to give us an idea whether this thyroid disease is likely to progress during pregnancy, whether there is possibly greater risk of pregnancy loss, or whether there is greater risk of having thyroiditis, which is a destructive process of the thyroid after the delivery. So long-term prognostication also can possibly be done and is useful in clinical practice. We'll be back with you shortly after a break. Our country is making a song in the 75th of Amrit Mahatshav. Welcome back after the break as we continue our discussion with Drs. Unni Krishnan and Dr. Ghosh. We were talking about autoimmunity, you know, and a thyroid antibody positive test means that the cause is autoimmunity. And we know the bulk of thyroid disorders, hypothyroidism, are autoimmune in nature. Uh, this is often also called Hashimoto's disease. And sometimes people get very scared on hearing about the diagnosis of autoimmunity or Hashimoto's disease, uh, does it really have an impact on how we look at the condition or how we treat it or the prognosis of the disease? Uh, Dr. Ghosh, please. Right. So the first thing is, like you've correctly pointed out, that the commonest cause of thyroid disorder in India or maybe world over is autoimmune thyroid disorders. If somebody has hypothyroidism, with an antibody positive, all that it tells us is what the possible cause is without any implication on the course of treatment that that individual gets in terms of levothyroxine replacement therapy. It's only in the borderline cases that I've discussed that probably tells you what 
the long term thyroid disorder is going to be like. So someone from subclinical hypothyroidism with an antibody positivity is more likely to progress to overt hypothyroidism. But what I find, and I, I'm sure you see in your clinical practice as well, people have done an anti-TPO antibody test and then they keep on repeating it to figure out as if the thyroid hormone replacement therapy is going to make it better. So if you've done it once, if it's pos positive, forget about it. Don't repeat that test ever again in your life because the titer or the value of that test, whether it goes up or goes down, has nothing to do with the outcome of the thyroid disease or the response to treatment. The other issue that people start worrying about is whether that individual has other autoimmune disorders. Normally, we do not screen for other autoimmune disorders in an individual who's got autoimmune thyroid disease unless and until you have very strong reasons to believe that there are problems with the other glands. For example, someone's got type 1 diabetes might be anti-TPO antibody positive telling us that the type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. With that, you've got this hypothyroidism, which is also autoimmune. And if you have specific symptoms of other autoimmune conditions, only then you think of doing those autoimmune tests. Fortunately, even though we say that, you know, if you have an anti-TPA positivity, you have greater chance of having other autoimmune diseases. Remember, the baseline risk of having an autoimmune disease is very less. Now, even if that very little risk risk gets doubled, tripled or four times, you're, you're multiplying a very small number with whatever multiplication factor you're looking at. Therefore, stop worrying. If you have other symptoms, only then get in touch with your doctor to screen for other autoimmune disorders. Well, thank you, Sujay, for saying something very close to my heart. We struggle with this all day. Uh, people are anxious about their autoimmunity and thyroid antibody positivity. It's not anything to worry about. It's a common cause of thyroid. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean anything more than that. So we actually, endocrinologists, ask for the least number of antibody tests, but everyone else seems to be doing it all the time. Uh, yes, there may be associated autoimmune conditions, which your doctor will tell you if there's any clue, any symptom, those should be investigated. Uh, another important part here is that the, the name Hashimoto's, and that's people get very scared by hearing Hashimoto's, was a respected Japanese scientist who described this condition. So it just sounds more exotic to call it Hashimoto's. It doesn't make it more serious or more dangerous in any way, just to put it in perspective. Uh, you know, we've been talking about autoimmunity. And, and, and before I go to the next part, I think it's important for me to explain what was the most common cause of hypothyroidism in India before, uh, say, all this autoimmunity thing came on. It's not that the autoimmunity changed as Dr. Unikrishnan said, but a huge cause, a cause of hypothyroidism that was affecting millions of Indians has actually been almost totally eradicated, and that is iodine deficiency. When I started my career in endocrinology, iodine deficiency related goiters were the most common site in our outpatient clinics. Uh, and there were vast tracts of inhabited land in the Tarai region, in, in, in the hills, where because of iodine deficiency, not only were people getting goiters, that is enlarged glands, and hypothyroidism, they were also getting mental retardation, particularly in children, something called cretinism, but even short of cretinism, a sort of impaired potential realization of brain uh, development. So I think that whole, the whole gamut, the whole spectrum of iodine deficiency disorders from goiter, that is just an enlarged gland, to little bit of brain damage to actual cretinism or mental retardation has been eradicated as one of India's biggest success stories. And how has that been eradicated? It's by iodation of salt. You know, just by simply adding iodine to salt so that people who consume salt, and everyone consumes salt, get enough amounts of iodine has eradicated this condition from India. So it really is either minimized or almost completely eradicated. We hardly see those large goiters. We don't see iodine deficiency related cretins that I used to see in my travels to all these uh, areas in Eastern UP, Bihar, Assam, all those places had significant proportion of children in villages 
who were mentally retarded because they lacked iodine and because that lack of iodine led to poor thyroid function when they were either in utero or in their early infancy and that led to all these problems. So I think that is one of the things that India can definitely be proud of. It's dealing with uh, iodine deficiency disorders and their eradication by universal addition of salt. So uh, let's have one more question, uh, you know, for Dr. Ghosh before we move to Dr. Unni. And that is, you know, uh, I was talking of iodine and that's all linked to food and, you know, diet. Are there any other dietary issues that predispose us to hypothyroidism or that we should follow once we are diagnosed with hypothyroidism? Right, I think that's, that's a very common question that people talk about and there are so many myths about it. So we've been taught, and, and this is there in the lay press as well, that there are certain food items that we call goitrogens. That means these food items contain certain substances which might cause goiter and which might impair thyroid function test. Now, technically speaking, maybe people are right. For example, cabbage, radish, all of that food stuff. But we really do not consume the amount of those foodstuffs which would actually probably lead to significant clinical problems. Stop worrying about these kind of food, not taking these kind of foodstuffs, that's number one. What is perhaps important is if you have developed hypothyroidism, there are certain things that can probably interfere with the absorption of the tablet that you're taking. We'll take that later. We'll take that later. But I think the importance of diet in causing or not causing hypothyroidism has been very uh, succinctly brought about for you. It couldn't be more clear than this. And I'm repeating it for you. We all understand that diet that we take does not have much of a role in development of hypothyroidism. It's predominantly autoimmune. And once we do develop hypothyroidism, there is no reason to modify our diets Correct. in a big way. Uh, I'll, I'll go to Dr. Uni Krishnan because you're going to go on treatment and then talk about things to do with treatment. Uh, so, Dr. Uni Krishnan, you know, one of the things that patients always tell you and me and Sujoy and others is that now that you've diagnosed me with hypothyroidism, I'm sort of, uh, you know, imprisoned for life. It's like a life sentence because I, I don't want to get onto your medication because I'm going to be stuck with this. So how do we treat hypothyroidism and is there any truth to the fears of being stuck with the medication lifelong? Well, uh, hypothyroidism is a simple deficiency of thyroid hormones. So when there is a deficiency uh, in the blood, uh, the fundamental principle of you know, endocrinology is that if there's a deficiency in, in a hormone, we replace it if possible. So when there is a deficiency of the thyroid hormone thyroxine, uh, then you can replace it with thyroxine pills. And this replacement uh, is absolutely uh, inexpensive in today's world. And also, uh, the other thing is that, is it lifelong? And that's a question patients ask us. Doctor, is my treatment lifelong? Well, in medicine, we do say never say never again, uh, in the sense that it, I'd like to use the word long term because if i tell my patients you'll never be able to stop it there'll be some group of people who are able to stop it but that's really really rare so long term treatment with thyroxine is necessary and also periodic dose adjustment is necessary we talked about autoimmune thyroid disease now autoimmunity is a condition where the body fights against its own thyroid gland during this fight sometimes the antibodies win or the body wins, sometimes the thyroid gland wins. When the antibodies win and the thyroid gland fails, the dose may need to be adjusted, may need to be increased. On the other hand, when the autoimmunity fails or the antibody fails or the body fails and the thyroid gland recovers, the dose can be reduced. How does a person with thyroid hypothyroidism know that uh, the dose needs to be increased or decreased? That's by doing a periodic test. So. The answer is, it's a long-term treatment. Unlikely that it will be stopped because the gland which has stopped making thyroxine uh, uh, may not be able to make it again. But having said that, periodic follow-up can give the answer. Some of the cases of mild 
subclinical hypothyroidism, which we talked about earlier, are known to spontaneously resolve on their own. And not all people require therapy, but yes, it's always best to check with your endocrinologist and decide on therapy. Yes, and the good part about uh, treating hypothyroidism is it doesn't require frequent follow-ups with your doctor. We need to check only once in a few months and sometimes in stable patients even once a year. I yes. mean, of course, unless you're pregnant or a newborn, that's a different story. But otherwise, generally speaking, you don't require frequent follow-ups. And I would just add that the use of telemedicine in, during the pandemic has taught us how easy it is to look after thyroid disorders in stable patients at least without a personal visit and actually only through telemedicine. So one of the group of disorders that is best managed through telemedicine is thyroid disorders or hypothyroidism. Not that you don't have to meet the doctor, but not every time. It may be possible to, for you to just connect from your home and actually uh, adjust your dose. Uh, I think, so, uh, Dr. Onikrishan, will you say it clearly once, thyroid hormone treatment is not addictive. The pill is not habit-forming. It's the gland that is not making enough hormone, and we are just replacing a deficiency. I told you initially, the gland's primary job is to make T4. This little butterfly here, it makes T4. If it makes less T4, we pour in some from outside, exactly the same molecule, and we, we sort of make up that deficiency. So it's like treating uh, you know, a deficiency, replacing a deficient uh, substance, rather than actually giving you something external, which will cause toxicity or side effects. So do you want to say thyroid hormones are not addictive? Absolutely. Thyroid hormones are not addictive. And I, what I like to tell people with hypothyroidism is that, look, your gland isn't making enough hormone. So really, when there's a deficiency of hormone, you replace that hormone with a simple oral pill. But at the same time, there's no side effect because there's only the effect of the drug. If you replace too much, you can, you can have a little bit more thyroid hormones. If you replace a little less, you'll have less thyroid hormones in the blood, you need to replace it in the Goldilocks zone or just right. And how will you know that? By symptoms, signs, and most importantly, the tests. So it's a long-term treatment, but it is not addictive. It's a replacement of a deficiency in the body, which is corrected by a simple oral thyroid hormone pill. So uh, what's your opinion? We all know our opinion, but I'm still asking you about uh, other modes of therapy sort of non-replacement modes of therapy. There are so many types of therapies floating around. People who claim they can cure your thyroid condition. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, there's no proven evidence that any of the alternative therapies can cure hypothyroidism. So therefore, people with hypothyroidism should not stop taking their thyroxine. And if they would like to start any alternative therapy, they must discuss with the doctor, not stop uh, uh, taking the medicine, and meanwhile, monitor the thyroid function test. If you were to ask my opinion, I feel that there is no proven benefit for alternative therapies of hypothyroidism because it's a very simple disease with a very simple therapy, and that therapy needs to be followed for the benefit of the people with hypothyroidism. And they need to take it, and there's no role for alternative therapy because there's no proven evidence. Very true. So I completely agree. We all know this is uh, science, but then these days misinformation spreads faster than information. So I think it's important that we bring these points out. Uh, uh, just to re-emphasize again that all the features, the symptoms that Dr. Ghosh pointed out about hypothyroidism, all the symptoms, you know, the, the heart, the brain, the skin, the hair, the, the menstrual cycles, everything. All that is reversible. Except, again, we are not talking of pregnancy and neonates, and we'll get one of our experts to say something about that in a short while. But the important part is, if you're taking your thyroid medicine, how do you take your thyroid medicine? Empty stomach in the morning and take nothing after that for 30 to 45 minutes. Very important to do that. Avoid taking supplements, as Dr. Ghosh briefly mentioned. Avoid taking supplements uh, for four hours after your thyroid pill, especially calcium, iron, etc. If you're doing this, then all the symptoms that he described, which could be ascribed to thyroid, will reverse on treatment. So a well-treated thyroid patient is like a normal person. 
If you are then getting symptoms, they are because of something else. And I think that's really, really important to understand. Uh, I'll come back to you, Sujoy. And really, uh, you know, what do you think is the role of lifestyle in terms of exercise and yoga? We already spoke about alternative medication uh, in, in managing thyroid. Right. Uh, like you said, in the lay press as well as information or misinformation, there's so much going around telling us that you do this, you do that, your thyroid will get cured. Exercise or healthy lifestyle should be part of everybody's life, you know, irrespective of whether you've got a thyroid problem or not. But from a scientifically point, scientific point of view, there is at, at this present point of time no evidence that if you change lifestyle in a perspective of X, Y or Z, that things are going to improve and no form of exercise is known to either cure or improve thyroid disorders. The only thing that probably you should not be doing is you should not be taking tobacco in the form of smoking, particularly if you've got thyroid eye disease. The rest, we are not very sure that anything else works. In terms of the supplements and diet, the other things that we were talking about, there is some evidence of something called selenium, which is there in most of the food stuff. Again, that's very, very, you know, not very strong evidence for selenium either. And the other thing that you mentioned was about avoiding calcium, iron. With the tablets, I think I'll just add one more thing, that is soya products should yes, be avoided absolutely. in the morning when you're taking the tablet, at least for three to four hours. Thereafter, you can take it if you, if you enjoy taking soya products. But otherwise, exercise, yoga is good for health, but I'm not very sure it's anything special for your thyroid health. So it's all boiling around to just one thing. Get a proper diagnosis from a qualified uh, doctor and make sure you take your thyroid medicine properly and regularly. Don't experiment with it. Don't try to stop it without asking your doctor and you'll be, you'll be fine. Uh, Dr. Oni Krishnan, you want to add something to the treatment part? And then we'll take a short break immediately after that. One of the important things is that treatment with thyroid hormones makes people with hypothyroidism better. But it takes some time for that symptom relief to set in. It may take up to four to six weeks for the thyroid hormone levels to stabilize. So it may take some time for you to get better. So do wait. And I think it's a very simple disease with a very simple treatment. And uh, there's no need to panic. People with hypothyroidism, when they're treated and the thyroid functions are normal, they do very well. Well, thank you, Dr. Oni Krishnan, for re-emphasizing and reassuring our viewers about the safety of thyroid medication, about the simplicity of uh, uh, treating hypothyroidism. Uh, but it's important that we continue to adhere to our medication and take it properly because if you don't take the medicine, it won't have any effect. I don't think that's rocket science. We'll take a short break and be back with the one condition we've said except every time, which is the neonatal hypothyroidism. That means hypothyroidism in the newborn. And we'll have Dr. Ganesh Jevlikar, consultant pediatric endocrinologist at Max Healthcare New Delhi, enlighten us about neonatal hypothyroidism after the break. Welcome to the third episode of Economic Sutra. Here we are going to explore a brand new field of drones. This looks like fun. Yeah. Let's take this along. Hard work being movie stars. We will talk to uh, one of India's top drone innovators and uh, hopefully we will give you a flavor of the kinds of new things that are emerging in this field. We've gotten rid of all the red tapism. We've gotten rid of all the policy constructs that would hold back entrepreneurism and allowed India as a country, 1.3 billion people to engage with this new technology. Welcome back. 
Uh, we'll now talk about conditions where thyroid problems can lead to serious consequences. One of them is pregnancy. So in an ideal world, every pregnant woman should be screened for thyroid and should be treated if found to be deficient because it is the maternal thyroid hormone that helps the fetal brain to develop in the early part of pregnancy. So actually screening for hypothyroidism in pregnancy is very important. And I personally feel, and our societies, the endocrine society, the thyroid society, we all feel that every pregnant woman in this country should be screened for hypothyroidism and treated if required. Uh, we'll now uh, talk about the baby when it's born. And to do that, as I said, I have my colleague, Dr. Ganesh Jevlikar from uh, uh, Max Healthcare, who is a pediatric endocrinologist and deals with this problem day in and day out. Uh, what is so special about neonates and hypothyroidism? Well, at the outset, thank you, Dr. Mittal, for having me here on the show. And uh, I think the most important thing uh, about newborn and childhood is growth. And not just the physical growth, but uh, brain uh, growth also. Because the first few years of life are the uh, stage of life where the brain is growing to its maximum capacity. And thyroid hormone is extremely important right from within the womb. Uh, and in the first few years of life for the brain growth. It also affects uh, physical growth and functioning of all the organs as you have already elaborated in details in this program. Uh, now, uh, after the birth of the ch child, the baby is totally dependent on its own thyroid hormone and is not supported by mother as during the womb. And therefore, if there is a deficiency of thyroid hormone in the newborn baby, which happens either because the thyroid gland is not formed properly or there is some problem in the machinery of the gland that is responsible for making the thyroid hormones. And that causes a condition called as congenital hypothyroidism. And uh, if there is a deficiency of thyroid hormone in the newborn, it can irreversibly affect the brain development. And that is the main importance of diagnosing this condition at the right time. So, so how do we diagnose? I mean, it, this, is, this is the bad news about thyroid. Yeah. The bad news about thyroid is that if neonates go undetected and untreated for their thyroid condition, then they can land up with irreversible brain uh, effects or brain damage, actually, uh, quite unlike the reversibility of almost all thyroid symptoms in adults. So how does one diagnose hypothyroidism in children? How do you do it, Ganesh? Well, uh, actually, uh, the interesting fact is that the diagnosis of congenital hypothyroidism is extremely simple. And this is done by a very simple test, which can even be done without pricking the child, just by taking a blood sample from the co umbilical cord, or by taking just a small heel prick sample, similar to what we do for blood sugar monitoring by glucometer, on day three or, beyond, uh, day three or four of life, and uh, a simple test, TSH, which is very cheap to do, can diagnose this condition. Now, uh, why we should test uh, for diagnosing, uh, or why, should, why we should have this additional prick for a diagnosis of this particular condition is firstly because it is extremely common. Uh, studies from India have shown that congenital hypothyroidism affects every one baby amongst 1,000 or 1,200 babies which means that practically every hour, nearly one or two or three babies are born with congenital hypothyroidism. And in majority of these babies, almost 95% of them, they look entirely, totally normal. They do not have any symptoms. And by the time they develop symptoms, it's already, already too late to initiate the treatment. The physical growth, of course, can recover. But as I said earlier, that the brain damage does not fully recover and the child is left with so this is one of the most common preventable cause of intellectual disability. And that is the reason that we have to do a test which is very simple and highly effective in diagnosis of this condition. So I think uh, it's the message is very strong and very clear that one out of, say, 1,200 newborns in India has hypothyroidism. If we did a neonatal screening, as we call it, for hypothyroidism, by testing their cord blood or by a heel prick sample, and we tested their TSH, diagnosed hypothyroidism, 
and initiated treatment in the first few days of life, those children will go on to realize their full brain, brain potential, will not be mentally retarded or handicapped in any way. The opposite being that if you miss these, you're actually adding to the miseries and woes of the, of course, the baby and the family forever. So, therefore, uh, the, uh, the Indian Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Endocrinology, of which Dr. Ganesh is the secretary, has a clear stand on this. What's the stand about screening for neonatal? So, uh, basically, uh, ISPE, or the Indian Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Endocrinology, released a, a statement, which was a consensus statement, which was published in Indian Journal of Pediatrics in 2018, which mandates every single newborn, irrespective of where the delivery has happened, to have a screening test for congenital hypothyroidism, which is the TSH test. This test has to be done at the time of birth on cord blood or after 48 to 72 hours of life by taking a heel prick sample. And uh, obviously the subsequent early, the follow-up of the test reports have to be done and the treatment has to be initiated within first two weeks of life with adequate dose of thyroxine uh, to have totally normal outcomes. And it is entirely possible to have, as you rightly pointed out, absolutely normal physical as well as intellectual development of the child if the treatment is started before two weeks of age. Yeah, you think you want to add something? Yeah, and uh, so uh, because in the first few months, uh, frequent follow-up or uh, doing the test of T4 and TSH to assess the efficacy of the treatment, is also important and compliance and adherence to treatment is also a very important. So diagnosis is the first step and adequate treatment is the second step which can ensure a healthy baby. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Ganesh for those very very important points. Vital public health points for a country like ours. Uh, it's very important that we have a screening program for neonatal hypothyroidism in place sooner rather than later so that we can diagnose these newborns at birth or soon after birth and help them realize their mental potential rather than making them handicapped or brain damaged in some way. Uh, thank you very much for your inputs. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Unikrishnan, who spared so much time, and Dr. Sujoy Ghosh, who's come all the way from Calcutta, eminent people in the field of thyroidology who've spared their time to educate our public about thyroid, the butterfly gland. Thank you.